Welcome to the Libido Lounge, where we focus on all things love, lust, and libido. We believe that fabulous sex is important to health as exercise and good food. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Lounge. In today's episode, we are talking about glucocorticoids. We're talking about stress, really. We're talking about stress, its impact on sex hormones, and what you can do about it. So one of the things I always like to remind people because I hear this so much is there is so much more to libido than just sex hormones. So when we fix sex hormones and sex hormones being estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, we find that not only does libido turn on in many different situations, that we gain muscle, we gain brain clarity, we gain cardiovascular benefits, we help our bones, we help our confidence, our body image, on and on and on. So there's many good reasons to work on sex hormones, but sometimes, and not infrequently, women will find that when they fix their sex hormones, it's not enough to turn on their libido. Other times it's enough, but for many women, the sex hormones are one very, very important piece of a larger picture. So I wanna make sure we're not getting lost and just thinking that, oh, sex hormones are the be all answer of everything and remembering that there's a lot more to the story than just sex hormones as we begin this journey. So one of the things to understand is the body is so deeply intricate. One of the purposes and the ways hormone work in the body is by talking and communicating and impacting each other. So for example, testosterone is our building hormone. It's libido, it's energy, it's muscle. It's really, really hard to put on muscle without enough testosterone. It's one of the reasons that men can put on muscle so much easier. I've seen situations where women go on a tiny bit of testosterone and all of a sudden their workout intensity changes dramatically and their results from their workout change dramatically because of what testosterone does. It's an amazing hormone that way. So in addition to that, in addition to all the wonderful things about becoming more muscular, we want to remember that too much also is not good, right? Too much testosterone and we can get body hair where we don't, don't want, for example, so we can have this these male features change. We, we don't want too much testosterone, but that right amount is really important. So stress can impact testosterone, and stress brings us to that conversation of cortisol. So you'll hear this in other episodes. I talk about this a little bit because there's a, a huge misunderstanding about cortisol being the stress hormone, and a lot of people hear cortisol and they think, wait, I'm gonna put on weight, cortisol's bad, you want cortisol out of your life, the stress hormone's bad. But cortisol is not all bad. If you did not have cortisol, you would literally die, right? Cortisol is actually essential to your daily survival. So we want, we don't want too much that can cause things like weight gain, right? We don't want too little that will actually kill you if you're, if it's completely flatlined and really low cortisol can make you feel very fatigued, not motivated, not able to function, right? So it's all about that sweet spot with any of these hormones. They all have their purpose. Too much is bad. Too little is also bad. So the stress hormone cortisol, when it is out of balance, and I want to be very careful to, you know, to talk about that. When it's out of balance, one of the things we can see is that cortisol will actually lower testosterone, right? But testosterone will raise cortisol. So there's kind of this like inverse type of relationship. So if we go to the gym, right, and we're doing something like high intensity interval training, what we actually see is testosterone levels increase. And we also see then cortisol levels increase. But if we're going through a lot of stress and we have this dysfunctional cortisol running through our system, that cortisol can actually decrease our testosterone. So this is another reason when we're stressed, it can be a lot easier to put on weight, to become flabby, to lose muscle growth, the libido goes down, that that stress and testosterone, not only like oftentimes with stress, like I talk about in some of the other podcasts, right, this concept of the brain not being present and that overwork type of mentality that happens when we're stressed, 
And all of that can happen because of cortisol being elevated and, and, and the subsequent feelings, the symptoms from that. But the low libido that's resultant of the stress also can happen because cortisol can lower testosterone. And testosterone's really that, that rev up, that get me ready, that I'm ready to you know jump somebody's bones kind of hormone, right? And so essentially that's part of what's happening with cortisol and testosterone. Now we see that estrogen is also very unique. So estrogen can cause a raise in cortisol levels. So we see this especially in postmenopausal women that estrogen will raise cortisol levels. But interestingly enough, when combined with progesterone, that does not happen. So this is another example of how all of these hormones really do this deep and intricate dance together. And so we see that, okay, well, we we talk a lot about progesterone needing to balance estrogen. Estrogen is very proliferative. Estrogen multiplies cells. Progesterone can prevent that from happening. So something like endometriosis, right, which is a condition where people have uterine tissue growing outside of their uterus and that's really bad. Like when this happens, for example, like if you have uterine tissue growing all over your intestinal tract, and then if you're cycling, you go through a cycle, then it's the, since you have so much uterine tissue growing out of the uterus, imagine your intestinal tract cramping because it now actually is lined with uterine tissue. And progesterone, low progesterone is oftentimes seen in that situation. So progesterone prevents, if it's elevated, if it's a healthy level, it's going to prevent against that proliferative component of estrogen. But in addition, it's going to help prevent the rise of cortisol that can happen if estrogen is as elevated or supplemented or prescribed alone. So this is another reason why if you go back and you look at episode 20, listen to episode 24, where I talk about hormonal harmony in episode 24, I talk about what test to make sure that you are running. And so I talk about a test called the urinary hormone test. I won't talk about that here because I already talked about that. But the importance of that really is remembering that all of these different hormones are so deeply interconnected and they all play a very, very, very important role. So essentially we need to make sure that we're considering cortisol and its stress impact on estrogen, cortisol and its stress impact on progesterone and testosterone, as well as the bi-directionality of those sex hormones actually impacting cortisol. So one of the other things I haven't talked about much yet on this platform is the adrenal, the natural adrenal rhythm, right? So when we're talking about cortisol, another thing to understand about stress is that there, the stress hormone cortisol has this natural rhythm. So what's supposed to happen in health is we get up, cortisol rises, and it stays fairly high in the morning and it slowly decreases throughout the day until the evening when it falls, right? That's the advantage of doing that urinary hormone test I talked about in episode 24 is because we can actually see then the, those rhythms, like if you do that urinary hormone test, you'll urinate and you'll do this four times, like from the test wise, you'll do that four times throughout the day to actually see that cortisol level, you know, what your cortisol level is doing. Now, it's very useful, right? Because then you can, if it's like, say it's too low around noon, you can do something like an adrenal glandular to bring that level up for you at noon. If it's too high at the evening time when you're trying to sleep, you can use something like magnolia bark, which has really been shown to lower cortisol. So we can start to manipulate treatment based upon those types of lab results, which is really cool. But another thing that is really useful from a libido standpoint is oftentimes when people do these sorts of tests, it's very common that one of the things I'll hear is like, oh, my cortisol level dips at three in the afternoon. That's when I have my biggest low. Or my cortisol level dips at six. That's when I have my biggest low or that's when I have my biggest high. So when we're thinking about what I talk about in other episodes, the concept of scheduling sex and the concept of like in order to make libido a part of your life, we it's helpful to schedule it like exercise. 
Exercise is something that I always do in the morning because I've learned personally that that's when my energy, even when everything's really balanced, I'm just the morning person. I have the most energy in the morning. So I like to work out in the morning because that's when I can work out the hardest. If I wait until after work, then I do it and it's enjoyable, but I don't have the stamina to push myself the same as if I work out in the morning. So we can apply similar concept to libido and understanding if you do a test like a cortisol test, you can really apply the same sort of concept. So essentially what you could then do is let's say your cortisol is the best that you have the most energy, the cortisol is the best at 10 a.m., right? You, know, you really see that on the lab test, yeah, it feels right in your body. Then you can talk to your partner about, okay, well, can you have on the weekends or if you guys have time off during the week or flexible schedules, you know, but but at least on the weekend, is there possibility in having sex or having any sort of intimate experience as close to that time as possible? You know, with kids and work, it might not always be perfect, but the idea is to say, okay, this is my rhythm. This is when I'm going to have the most energy. And oftentimes, you know, oftentimes I find that as we age that, you know, that sex before bed or that sex, you know, certain points of the day, really it's very, very hard and it gets pushed off and oftentimes ignored because you're fatigued, right? And so there's definitely things we can do. You know, adrenal glandulars are really good for helping with energy. We can make sure we're nutrient. We have a lot of nutrients. So your basis like B vitamins and CoQ10 can provide a lot of energy if you're deficient in them. But beyond that, there is a natural rhythm that changes as we age. So the idea is understanding your natural rhythm, understanding your partner's natural rhythm, and hopefully it overlaps somewhat. And essentially then basically finding, okay, what times of the day are available and what days of the week are available with those times to actually schedule a sex date during that time. And, you know, maybe that means like a babysitter for a couple hours on that day, right? There's lots of different ways to get creative here, but it can be a lot more fun to engage sexually when you have the energy for it versus like, I'm tired, I got an early day, I got to get up in the morning. Or the other thing that, you know, that sometimes I see happen is that, you know, people will try to get sex in at bedtime and then they'll stay up later and then they'll skip their morning workout if that's something that is in the routine. And that can cause other problems because then you're not getting the movement, right? So how to keep this all balanced is really to look at your calendar is literally to schedule that and to make your sex life work for you. And I find that when we do that, it's it truly is. It's so much more enjoyable. All of a sudden, it takes out that elephant in the room, that elephant in the head that was screaming like, I'm tired, I want to get my workout in, or I'm tired, I just got to get to bed because I got to get up early and I got to take the kids to school, whatever it is. It gets those voices out of the head. So when I've talked in other episodes, such as the previous one on lifestyle and on working on being present, the more we can get those other distractions out, those voices that say, I'm tired, I should get to bed, the more we can work with our natural cortisol rhythms wherever we are in our cortisol world, the better we can actually enjoy our sex and our libido and the more motivated oftentimes we're, we're feeling that way too. So the last thing to mention here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just because it is also mentioned with the stress and sex or it's part of the stress and sex connection is DHEA. So I talk about this also in episode 24, but again, that's that precursor to estrogen and testosterone is super duper amazing. I see so many women respond so well to liquid versions of this applied on the topically on the vulva. And yeah, it can just help with so many symptoms and can really help with that desire as well. So this has been another episode of The Lounge. Thanks again for tuning in. This is Dr. Diane reminding you to stay classy, stay sexy, and always be a little badassy. Thank you for listening to The Libido Lounge. Please don't keep me a secret. Please share this with your friends. You can find me on YouTube, on Instagram, as well as how to work with me at mylibidodoc.com. 